Well, welcome today as we jump into this Easter season together. Last Sunday was such a blast and I just want to go out of my way to thank all the volunteers that uh, help behind the scenes in the worship services, um, doing everything they can to, again, carry out our mission statement of meeting Jesus, making friends and making a difference. Today we're going to be focusing on a, a post-resurrection account that's in the Bible in John chapter 21 of Jesus meeting with his disciples for the third time. Also, later on in this morning's service, I'll be talking a little bit about what's going on with our foundation for our future capital campaign. Next Sunday is a big day. You know, we're, it's Commitment Sunday. It's also that we'll be having a prayer vigil. But let's make our beginning now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For our confession today, we're going to be focusing on a story from, again, John chapter 21. And it describes how even though the risen Jesus had already appeared to his disciples two times, they still felt unworthy and unfit to be in his presence. Why? Because when Jesus was arrested, they ran away. When it really mattered, they failed and deserted him. So they assumed, how could Jesus still want us to be core leaders in his mission and movement? So subsequently, they decided to go back to their old way of life. They headed back to the Sea of Galilee to start fishing again. But what happens whenever we put my will be done ahead of the Lord's will being done? What happens whenever we fail to turn away from destructive behaviors and habits? What happens whenever we refuse to forgive others? What happens whenever we neglect to, you know, give up our being selfish and let going of our poor attitudes? Well, whenever we intentionally walk away from God's word and his will, this always results in death. Our faith and our relationship with Christ don't grow. Instead, they stagnate, they wither, and they get weak. So let's silently confess our sins and our need for God's mercy. Jesus hears our sincere confession. And when we fail, when we fall short, when we cross the line, when we miss the mark, all of those sins were piled on Jesus on Good Friday. He's paid for them in full. And when he rose up from the dead, it proves that we're fully forgiven. The Heavenly Father has accepted his sacrifice. And as we trust and we follow him, we're fully forgiven in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, for our first reading this morning, we want to look at God's New Testament word from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and following. And this is one of the greatest accounts in the entire Bible about the power of the resurrection. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. Through what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Though you have not seen him, right? Though we do not see Jesus, we love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you're receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Here ends our first reading. Our gospel reading today is from John chapter 21, verses 1 and following. And this will serve as the text for today's sermon. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples the third time by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas also called Dynamis, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. And he said, Well, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples 
after he had raised from the dead. Well, this time, let's profess our faith in the Apostles' Creed. And again, as we get to the end of that second car article in the Creed, it emphasizes that we believe in the resurrection, right? Jesus was resurrected, and we believe that we too, following him, will one day rise from the dead. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's watch today's sermon video that will... Grace is God's unmerited favor for us, His crazy love. And the truth is, many times we struggle understanding it. If you find yourself struggling to understand God's grace, don't beat yourself up. Even the disciples struggled with understanding grace. Jesus, is that you? You're alive! I can't believe you're alive! Okay, I was in the boat and I wasn't catching any fish, okay? But I heard this voice and the voice said, cast your net to the other side. And so I'm thinking, I'm a fisherman, I know what I'm doing, but I'm not catching any fish, you know? And so I throw that net over there and then a gaggle of fish pop into that net and I'm going, this is a total miracle. Who could have done that? I need to know who told me to throw the net to the other side. And boom, I look up and I mean, there is you. You're looking at me on the seashore going, it is I, the Lord, and you're alive! I can't believe you're alive! <laughs> this is awesome! Andrew, get out of the boat, come on! Peter, yeah. do you love me? Yes, I love you. I love you. You're alive. This is so great. Good, and, then feed my sheep. Andrew, get out of the boat. Come on, man. It's him. Peter, Yeah. do you love me? I love you, yes. And I'm so sorry about that rooster cluck, and I had no idea what that meant, but I do not. I'm better for it, all right? Okay. Good, then feed my sheep. Andrew, I'm smiling, but I'm serious. Come on, get out of the boat. It's him. Peter, Yeah. do you love me? Jesus, mere words cannot describe the passion that I have for you. I love you. You know everything. I love you. Good. Good. Then feed my sheep. I didn't even know you had livestock. That is so like you, though. There's something new about you all the time. That's what I love about you. Peter, yeah. do you remember uh, the morning the ladies went to the tomb? Yeah, 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 yeah. We're all in the upper room trying to figure out what to do next, you know, because we thought you were dead. You know, you were dead, you know, and we're trying to figure all that out, you know. And Mary comes running up, and Mary's like saying, beehive, beehive, beehive. And I'm thinking, I'm allergic to bees. Like, keep them out. You know what I'm saying? But as she kept getting closer, I heard her correctly. She was saying, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. And we're going, who's alive, who's alive? And she said, she was at the tomb, and the tomb was empty. And she said that the, there was an angel there, and the angel said, go tell the disciples and Peter that everything is okay, he is risen. And so, me and John, we hightailed it down there, and if John says he beat me, he's totally lying, all right? I beat him, FYI, all right, you know? And we get down there, and I'm looking in that tomb, and it is, it is empty. There's nothing in there, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, what does this mean? What does this mean? And John is right there. John is so good with words. He should write a book. He is so good with words. And John said, don't you get it, Peter? This is everything Jesus said he was going to do, and you did it, and it's done. Let's go. This is so great. Wait, yeah. the angel said what? Uh, go tell the disciples and Peter that everything is okay. He is risen. You've risen. Let's go. This he is said what? Go tell the disciples and Peter. Go tell the disciples and Peter. You said my name. Why did you say my name? Peter, that's grace. No, no, I don't, I don't deserve that because that night people kept coming up to me asking me if I belonged to you, if I was with you, and I kept denying you left and right, all right? No, no it'll take me my whole life to make up for what I did. It was unforgivable for no, what I did. No, What I did on the cross was meant to take what is unforgivable and make it forgivable. That's my grace. It's not about you. It's always about me. That's grace, Peter. You know, English professors often catch their students using mixed metaphors while writing term papers. And one professor posted a few examples of these on his website. And here they are. It's time to step up to the plate and cut the mustard. She's robbing Peter to pay the piper. He's up to 
up a tree without a paddle and finally she's burning the midnight oil at both ends. People are sticking two things together that shouldn't be together. Well, today as we study John chapter 21 verses 1 through 19, it'll appear that we're also sticking two things together. Mixed metaphors because the first half of this section from God's Word talks about fishing and the second half emphasizes shepherding. But together we're going to learn these vital truths. First of all, that Jesus' love and forgiveness always provide a fresh start. And secondly, they empower us to faithfully serve in his name. So let's set the scene. After Jesus had risen from the dead, several of his disciples, including Peter and John, had traveled 70 miles north to the Sea of Galilee. It's their old stomping grounds. But what, what in the world are they doing there? After all, the risen Jesus had already triumphantly appeared to them twice. But the white elephant in the room for all these disciples was how could Jesus possibly still want them to be leaders, core leaders in his mission and cause, knowing how much he had already, they had failed him, denied him, and deserted him right before his crucifixion. So internally, these disciples were assuming they were no longer fit, qualified, or worthy of such a great calling. So they decided to head back to their old lives, fishing on the Sea of Galilee. And by the way, we can relate with this, can't we? You know, sometimes also we beat ourselves up. We wallow in shame and we withdraw from others whenever we fail or, or let them down. So Peter says to the other disciples this short statement. I'm going to go out to fish, right? I'm going back to Galilee. And they're like, their reply is, we'll go with you. Now, keep in mind, all of these guys were professional fishermen before they were Jesus' disciples. So they took turns throwing the heavy water-soaked nets into the water all night long. And it would look something like this. And unfortunately, every time they cast out the nets and they drag it back in, they're empty-handed. They don't catch a thing. And by the way, whenever we bail on Jesus and his mission, thinking there's something better out there for us, we're going to end up with the same result. A whole lot of nothing. So, back to the story. Fishing all night has left these guys beat, tired, discouraged, dejected. They're like, let's cut our losses and head home. But meantime, some guy from the shore, whom they can't recognize because of the early morning haze, is shouting at them and saying these words of verse 6. Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. Like, that's going to make any difference? Like, if we cast the net over here and drag it in and then put it 10 feet more on this side of the boat. But the crazy thing is, these guys listen to that anonymous voice and you know what happens next. Remember, they're catching so many fish, it's a miracle. There's so many lunkers, they can't drag them all into their boat. It's a miracle really in two ways. First of all, they netted 153 large fish. You wanna talk about reaching your limit. And secondly, their fishing net didn't break in spite of the fact that they were dragging in all of this weight. So suddenly amid all of this chaos, something clicks in John the disciple's mind. He puts two and two together and he says, it's the Lord. And the next thing you know, Peter jumps overboard, right? He bails on the other disciples and he starts swimming like crazy to shore. Why? Because this isn't the first time a miracle like this has occurred. Three years earlier, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he told a man named Simon, whose name he later changed to Peter. These words in Luke chapter 5. He says, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answers in verse 5. He says, Master, we've worked hard all night. And just like this example we just read, they didn't catch anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And as a result, Simon and his brother Andrew caught so many fish, they had to shout to James and John to bring their boat over. And they filled both boats so full of fish. Remember the story? They were starting to sink. And when they got to shore, Jesus says to Simon, wasn't that a blast catching all those fish? But let me give you a much greater, grander vision. From now on, instead of making dollars catching fish, let's change people's destinies. Follow me and become a fisher of men. And the next thing you know, Peter, Andrew, James, and John 
leave their boats, their fishing tackle, all of their stuff behind on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and they follow Jesus for the next three years. Now we know why, all this time later, Peter is hastily jumping into the water and swimming to shore as fast as possible because he knows that only Jesus could have caused that miraculous catch of fish once again like this. And by the way, Jesus also had to miraculously prevent them from catching a single fish all night long, the evening earlier, right? So that this miracle could occur at just this right moment. But nevertheless, knowing Jesus had come all the way, gone through all the trouble of tracking them down once again at that Sea of Galilee, it could only mean one thing. Those disciples knew Jesus wasn't done with them. The Savior who had died for them was once again intentionally calling them to live and lead for me. Jesus was giving them a fresh start. And this is a good reminder that whenever we become discouraged along the way, you know, especially at those times when our lives aren't unfolding the way we had hoped or predicted, nothing, nothing is more important than an imperative and the calling that Jesus has placed on your life and mine. Jesus personally sought you out. He claimed you as his own. He washed away your sins through the waters of holy baptism. He adopted you into his family of faith. He covered you with his precious righteousness and holiness and forgiveness that all flow from Calvary's cross. So absolutely nothing matters more than this truth. And no matter what difficulties or challenges confront you and me, no matter what we encounter along the way, Notice what Jesus promises in John chapter 10. No one, nothing can snatch you out of my hand. And when Peter and the other disciples eventually got to shore, God's word says this in John 21 verse 9. They saw a charcoal fire set up with some fish on it and some bread. By the way, that word charcoal there, it's only used two times in the entire New Testament. In this context, and earlier when Peter warmed himself by the fire in the high priest's courtyard the night he denied Jesus. You know how aromas often bring back memories? I can't help but wonder if that pungent aroma of charcoal immediately made Peter feel uncomfortable as he recalled denying Jesus three times before the rooster crowed. Nevertheless, everyone knew it was Jesus who was serving them on that shore. And all of us have heard about the Last Supper, but I guess you could say this, on this occasion, Jesus was preparing the last breakfast. So he's graciously providing filet of fish sandwiches. And as they quietly stared his nail-pierced hands, all of them with certainty had to have been thinking, wow, Jesus, you truly are alive, just as you promised. And better yet, his appearance there was clearly indicating this point. Guys, get back on point. Stop lallygagging around here. I called you to be fishers of men. And by the way, we unquestionably know that a fisherman, John, wrote this story because they counted every fish. You know, God's word doesn't say that there were approximately 150 fish. No, it says there were exactly 153 large fish. And years later, a guy named Jerome who was the first person to translate the Bible into everyday Latin in the 4th century, suggested the significance of this number 153. Since there were literally 153 different kinds of fish in the Sea of Galilee, perhaps Jesus was emphasizing that the gospel is for everyone, for all varieties, tribes, and nations. Who knows? All the same, those disciples then, as well as you and me today, are still called to be fishers and men, witnesses and missionaries, sharing the good news of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection to every person we meet in our circle of influence. But here's where the second metaphor, shepherding, comes into play. Remember the mixed metaphors? First was all about fishing, but now it gear shifts to shepherding. Standing next to that huge pile of 153 fish, Jesus doesn't tiptoe around the issue. Instead, he lovingly confronts and says in John 21, verse 15, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Now notice, Jesus doesn't call him Peter, the rock. He calls him Simon, 
by his old name. Now, Jesus then goes straight to our core, our heart, and asks, are any misplaced priorities tempting and causing you to push me aside? And Peter replies in verse 15. He says this, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then Jesus says, feed my lambs. Then Jesus says to Peter a second time in verse 16, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Well, Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Now, again, when you think about this, the first two times that Jesus asked Simon, do you love me? He uses a, a, a Greek word from agape, and agape means, do you love me enough to die for me? It's Christ-like, sacrificial love. This is the kind of love that Peter, by the way, boldly professed to Jesus on Monday, Thursday, but couldn't live up to. Then Jesus asked a third time in verse 17, Simon, son of John, do you love me? But this third time that he uses the word love, it's from the Greek word phileo, which means like, do you love me like a brother? Brotherly love, like Philadelphia, right? So Jesus is graciously lowering the bar of commitment and love to a level that Peter can reach. And Peter once again affirms his love for Jesus by replying in verse 17, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And then Jesus said, feed my sheep. Between the lines, Peter is really asking, Jesus, can you still use me? And each time Jesus reassures Peter of his charge and his responsibility. Peter, if you love me, then you'll take care of what, what I care about. And as I see you faithfully feeding and caring my sheep, taking care of my people, that's how I'll know that you love me. And by the way, every church today either succeeds or fails based on these two mixed metaphors, fishing and shepherding. If the church isn't regularly fishing, they're only one generation away from extinction. Without intentionally outreaching, doing evangelism and discipleship, churches wither, weaken, and eventually die. What are most churches better at, fishing or shepherding? Shepherding. And our church is no exception. We do a good job of feeding and tending the lambs and the sheep. We excel at caring for one another. But how about fishing? Who among us doesn't wish the worship attendance this Sunday would be the same or exceed that of last Sunday's Easter total? I know I do, but I'm always hoping for a catch of 153 fish. But the Holy Spirit can't catch fish through you and me if we aren't fishing. That's convicting, isn't it? And ultimately, this mixed metaphor of fishing and shepherding provides a healthy challenge for all of us as we move into the weeks and months ahead. Let's commit together to doing this, fishing for sheep and then shepherd the fish. One last thought. Look at what Jesus predicts about Peter's future after giving him this fresh start. He says these powerful words in verses 18 and 19. He says, Peter, when you're old, you're going to stretch out your hands, right? Sounds like a crucifixion, right? And someone else will lead you to where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. In other words, Jesus is simply saying, Peter, stop beating yourself up for denying me three times. Your failure is never fatal as you repent and trust in me. Instead, trust that you are forgiven. And eventually, you will love me with the agape kind of love, right? You're going to love me enough to die for me on a cross. But in the meantime, follow me. And that's the charge Jesus still gives you and me and all believers today. Although we can never love Jesus in a way that equals his limitless love and full forgiveness for us, his spirit and his gospel empower us to faithfully follow, fish, and shepherd with clean slates and fresh starts every day. Let's pray. Jesus, even though we can't see you, you're with us. And your resurrection presence strengthens and comforts us. Forgive us whenever we think our failures and sins are bigger than the power of your cross. Forgive us when we ignore your call and mission on our lives and, 
Decide to do things our way instead of yours. Pardon us whenever we impatiently fail to trust and wait on you. And Jesus, thank you for seeking us out and casting your net deep and wide. Draw us to you, especially when we're drifting from your presence due to brokenness, loneliness, pain, or selfishness. Then equip us as your forgiven and loved followers to cast your gospel net deep and wide to others. Empower our church to keep growing and fishing and shepherding so that more people are connected to Christ and are deeply cared for and fed with your word. Holy Spirit, over the past months, you have spoken to our congregation and helped us determine ways that we can further extend your kingdom work. Thank you for uniting us in vision. Now use our prayers, our service, and generosity so that the foundation for our future capital campaign will bring you glory and deeply advance your mission. Father, hear us as we silently lift these people who are heavy in our hearts this morning because of physical, emotional, relational, or financial needs. Pour out your physical healing and strength on Joel Boson, Chloe Getch, Pat Gunderson, Kevin Herzog, Jonette Johnson, Debbie Kelly, Karen Larson, Bob Larrabee, Jerry and Karen Ratcliffe, Mary Ryling, Gloria Sanford, Arlene Schwartz, and these people whom we silently name to you. Into your hands, Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has taught all of us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, just uh, again, a huge thank you to all the volunteers that have been assisting in many, many ways over the last two, three months in our Foundation for Our Future Capital Campaign. Next Sunday, May 1st, is a pivotal day for our church. We're going to ask everybody to make a commitment and that's, uh, the results of that will bless, you know, many things here. Worship uh, upgrades, staff upgrades, uh, maintaining and beautifying our grounds and facility, doing a number of things mission-wise that will extend the kingdom of God. So we're hoping that you will pray about this next Sunday from 7 to 8 a.m. Come early for that hour we'll be having a prayer vigil here at church, asking God to bless the campaign in the weeks and months ahead. Along with that, then, everybody in the church will be asked to be making a commitment uh, following Commitment Sunday on, on May 1st. So everybody will be contacted, will either be phoned, will be mailed a, a pledge card, and that's between you and the Lord. But if you would like to give something in addition to your regular tithes and offerings to be, again, Help us make a firm foundation for extending God's kingdom here in Ham Lake and in Andover area. We, would, we are very grateful if you would do so. Let's head out with the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his perfect peace. Amen. Let's head out with these sending words right from God's word. Jesus said, come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. You were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. The Lord says, I will give you shepherds after my own hearts, who will lead you with knowledge and understanding. So fishing and shepherding for the risen Savior, let's go in peace and serve the Lord. God's richest blessings to you this week.